Everybody has their own first truck, and for millions of Americans, it was the 88 to 98 K1500. Today, we ditch the factory 350 and R's for an inexpensive modern long block. Plus, this beefier trans will handle all that added power. It's time for Truck Tech. Today, we're going to be spending some time on this little red four wheel drive that we dropped to the ground. It's called Project Red Tide, and we lowered it four inches in the front and six inches in the rear, and it's sitting on a set of 20 inch GMC replica wheels. From the outside, it looks pretty sick, but underneath the hood, well, it's honestly unhealthy. The TBI 350 has 185,000 miles on it. It burns a bunch of oil and it smokes real bad. Now, Originally, this truck had 190 horsepower, but over the last 30 years, a lot of those ponies have escaped. So today, we're going to work on making this truck perform a little bit closer to how it looks, because right now, it's all show and no go. Over the years, we have made power upgrades to many different trucks. If you want to keep your original engine and spice things up a little bit, you could change some parts around in the induction department to let more air into and out of the engine. We added an additional 100 horsepower to this 351 Windsor simply by adding a larger camshaft, better flowing cylinder heads, a high flow aluminum intake, and a larger carburetor. Making big power with a naturally aspirated engine is a good way to have a responsive and fun driving engine, and when matched with a proper gear set, it can be a blast to drive. There are a lot of top end packages out there for the old school small block Chevy. And by increasing compression ratio and airflow, your horsepower will go up as well. The problem is on this bottom end, well, the piston rings are so worn, the pistons won't be able to hold back all that cylinder pressure to make the power that we're expecting. Really, all we'd be doing is wasting some money. Another option we could do is take apart the original engine, do some machine work, and increase the displacement with a stroker crankshaft. A 383 cubic inch small block Chevy can easily make 450 horsepower, and when topped with a proper induction, it would make great torque. The only problem with doing a stroker style rebuild of our stock 350 comes down to cost. When you consider the price of the rotating assembly, the pistons, rods, and crank, the cylinder heads, the valve train, not to mention the machine work that we'll need to make it all work together, and the new EFI system that we'll need to make it all run properly, we're going to have a bill somewhere in the neighborhood of six to eight thousand dollars. And that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense when it comes to figuring out the power gain for each dollar that we're going to spend. A power adder is also a great option, like this turbo system we installed on White Noise, a 2010 Silverado with a cammed 5.3. A single 76 millimeter turbocharger running at 8 pounds of boost pressure increased the power of this otherwise stock engine to 498 horsepower and 481 pounds of torque at the rear wheel. The great thing about a turbocharger or any power adder is how much horsepower that you'll gain for every dollar that you spend. They're really efficient in that sense. The problem is, again, this stock bottom end. So before we do anything, we need to take care of this worn out engine. You've probably figured it out by now. We're actually going to be doing an engine swap. And yes, it is part of the LS family. This is actually a 5.3 liter LM7 we picked up from Powertrain Products, and it's not stock. It's actually a high performance crate engine designed for swaps like we're doing in Red Tide. It comes in with a dyno proven horsepower of 400 and 392 pounds of torque at the flywheel. The camshaft comes in at 218 and 228 degrees of duration at 50,000 slip. It has upgraded valve springs, a heavy duty timing set, and an upgraded oil pump. And any factory issue that these engines had from GM have already been corrected. The best part is this whole long block only costs 3,500 bucks and it has a two year warranty, making it the perfect candidate for an engine swap like this. Now we're going to be doubling the stock power of that TBI 350. And the first thing we need to do is get it yanked out. Next, the proper way to pull a motor.
When you're going to pull an engine and transmission out of a pickup truck or really any vehicle, there are a lot of systems that you're going to have to physically disconnect before you can lift the powertrain out. You've got the electrical side of things, the air intake, the cooling system, power steering, air conditioning, transmission lines, a whole bunch of fluids that need to be drained out, and on top of that, a bunch of little small cables, brackets, and vacuum lines and things like that. So today I'm going to kind of slow things down just a little bit and show you guys the basics of removing an engine and transmission efficiently and without damaging anything. For safety reasons, the first thing to be disconnected and removed is the battery. Then the air cleaner and silencer tube come off. And we can tackle the wiring harness starting at the AC pump and the alternator. All right, so the only time I want to see you grab a pair of wire cutters on a project like this is for cutting something like a zip tie. Now, I know there's a lot of small vacuum lines and things that you think you might not need to use again, and it's easier just to snip them. But take the time, disconnect everything properly, because you really never know what you need to reuse later on. On a fuel-injected engine, there are a lot of electrical connections to deal with, and several grounds as well. Each plug is different and they can only hook up to one sensor. So in the event you ever need to reconnect anything, there won't be any mix-ups. With everything disconnected, we can get the harness out of the way. All right, that's one big chunk. Toward the rear of the engine, the spark plug wires are disconnected from the distributor and the plugs at the coil are removed. Then the other end of the spark plug wires are unplugged and removed from the truck. There are three control cables that have to be disconnected at the throttle body. One for the cruise control, the throttle pedal, and the TV cable that controls transmission line pressure. Pulls off. This fluid evacuator is a cheap tool that pays for itself the first couple times you use it. Next are the return and pressure lines which get disconnected. And by tying the hose up to the alternator, we'll stop it from dripping all over the place. The fuel lines at the throttle body are disconnected. Then the coolant is drained and mostly collected in a pan. And with a little cleanup taken care of, we can remove the upper radiator hose. The top half of the fan shroud comes off, followed by the engine-driven cooling fan. So if this is the first time that you're doing any major work like this, pulling an engine out or doing a swap, it can be very difficult to keep track of all the hard work because you're going to have hundreds of tiny little nuts and bolts and washers and things like that. So one thing I do to keep track of where everything goes is put it back on after you've taken the part off. That way you know exactly where it goes and you're not hunting through a big bucket of bolts trying to figure out what went where. Next, I'll have to remove a few lines from the radiator an overflow, a heater core return, and both transmission cooler lines before the radiator can be removed from the truck. The Freon has leaked out some time ago, so I can disconnect the hoses on the back of the AC compressor. Now, a final heater core line and the vacuum line for the brake booster come off, and I can pull the fluid out of the transmission through the dipstick. Next, I'll get the truck up in the air and drain the fluid from the transfer case. We'll get both the rear and front drive shafts out of the way and set them in the scrap pile. We'll have to custom order new ones with the engine and transmission combination we've selected. I'll cut the exhaust in the middle and remove the rear section. Then, disconnect the bolts at the manifold. Somebody broke a stud off and the front Y-pipe and converter come out. We need to talk about what parts of the drivetrain we're going to remove at the same time. I have seen guys leave everything connected together or even just the transfer case to the transmission. The trouble with those methods is, well, they're very bulky and difficult to maneuver and your chances of damaging sheet metal are very high. If this is your first time pulling out a drivetrain, I recommend you break it down into as small of pieces as possible. Transfer cases, they're usually very light and easy to maneuver. Then the transmission, that pulls out very easily with the trans jack. And once those two parts are out, you can easily remove the engine from the top without damaging anything. So we'll get started by yanking off this transfer case. And after that, Mike lends a hand. That's next. We're a little more than halfway done pulling the drivetrain out of Red Tide, our 88 Chevy. 
I'll remove the converter cover, giving access to the bolts that hold the flex plate to the torque converter. On a 700R4, there are three. Once I remove the shift linkage, I can bring the trans jack in and slightly raise the transmission, getting the weight off the cross member so it can be removed. Finally, the main bolts that hold the transmission to the engine are threaded out, and the trans is slowly lowered down and removed from the truck. Now we're in the home stretch. Up top, all we have left to do is attach our lift sling to the exhaust manifold bolts and let our crane do the heavy lifting. I'll do that way just a hair. Come my way? Yep. The uh, manifold is hitting the cab. There we go. Doesn't get much easier than that. So you wanted me to ship this next door to y'all, right? Negative. This could be your first engine rebuild in here. No. Yeah. Oh, this is too high tech for me. All right, you need anything else? That's it, man. Hey, appreciate it. See you, man. See you next time. Just because the engine and drivetrain are removed from the truck doesn't mean the job of teardown is complete. There are a few more things that we need to remove from the engine bay to clean up some of this mess and make preparations for the 5.3 LS that's going to be living in here in just a little bit. And we'll get started by tackling this wiring harness. There are a lot of circuits in this harness that I won't need to reuse, mostly for the TBI electronics. But there are some wires that I'll need to keep, like for the starter, gauges, and alternator. So I'll remove it all from the truck and modify it later on. Next, the trans cooler lines go, followed by the heater hoses. Then I'll get the truck up in the air. Since I have something special planned for the front diff, I'll drain it, remove the bolts for the CV axles, unbolt the mounts, and get it out of the way for now. Then since we can't put a shiny new engine into a greasy truck, a quick degrease and a power wash will make the engine bay look much better. I think that'll work out nicely. Well, we've got our mess cleaned up, the truck is back in the shop, and we're ready to move on to the fun stuff. Now, the hardest part about doing just about any engine swap is finding a way to position the new engine into the old chassis in the correct position so things like the oil pan, exhaust system, and the intake manifold are going to clear without hitting any parts of the old body. Luckily, we're doing an LS swap and it's a very common thing to do nowadays, so there are a lot of options on the aftermarket that will allow us to easily bolt this engine into the K1500's chassis without doing any custom fabrication or guesswork. We picked up these adapters from Hooker Headers, and they're going to bolt onto the side of the LS engine block, and they have a place to mount the small block Chevy style engine side part of the original mounting system. Now on the chassis side, all we're going to do is use the original style rubber isolator, and this engine will be in the exact correct position for everything to fit. Now these install very easily. With a little thread locker, the adapters install using countersunk hardware. They are zinc plated for corrosion resistance and they're 3 8 inch thick for maximum strength. I trimmed the tab off the original spacer which we'll reuse to maintain proper alignment. And three bolts hold the whole thing together. The passenger side needed a small notch in the mount to clear the block. And it gets bolted onto the adapter. Now this LS is ready for our chassis. Next. Find out who is LT's next co-host. We're back on Truck Tech, preparing our new 5.3 to fit in our 88 Chevy. We could adapt our original 700R4 to work behind the new 5.3, but they're not the strongest transmission out there, and this one has a bunch of miles on it, so it would probably need a refresh anyway. Instead, we're going to be upgrading to a 4L80E. Now, you can almost think of them as an electronic turbo 400, but with overdrive, so they're already an upgrade over the old 700. But this is a Gearstar Level 3 build that's rated to withstand 600 horsepower. It's been modified inside to hold additional clutch packs over a stock build, has heat-treated shafts, and inside has all-new wiring and solenoids. And up front, it has a Yank 2800 RPM stall speed converter that'll really help our heavy truck get moving off the line, and it works well with our camshaft that we've selected. 
They also sent us a transmission cooler with a cooling fan built on top. And to complete the installation, we went to Summit Racing for a few odds and ends, like a transmission mount, an SFI certified flex plate with a converter pilot adapter for putting a 4L80 behind an LS, some ARP flywheel bolts, and of course, a dipstick. Our installation starts under the hood by bolting on some new stock replacement motor mounts, since the old ones had seen better days. Then we'll bring in the 5.3 and slowly lower it into place. With the hooker adapters, it drops in just like the old one came out. Well, that was way too easy. Then the stock bolts hold it all together. With the truck raised up in the air, we can install the SFI certified flex plate onto the back of the crank. To ensure a proper torque reading and stop them from backing out, the bolts get a dab of ultra torque and thread locker. Then they get torqued in sequence to 84 foot pounds. The new transmission comes in and the pilot spacer goes onto the converter. Then the transmission gets raised up into place, aligned on the dowel pins, and the hardware can go in. Never use the bolts to draw the transmission onto the dowels, as you can crack the aluminum case. Now the 4L80 gets raised up a bit higher, and the stock cross member can be installed onto the C channel of the frame. The studs are lined up, and the nuts are tightened up. One thing you want to check when you install any automatic transmission is that the torque converter can freely spin after the engine and trans have been bolted together. If it can't, the converter has been installed improperly and it's putting way too much pressure on the oil pump and it could cause damage. The converter bolts also get a dab of thread locker and they are installed but kept loose for now. Then the engine is spun by hand until all six bolts are in. Then they get torqued to 45 foot pounds. Lastly, it's important to install a torque converter cover as it's a structural part of the drivetrain. This one came from Summit Racing. Anytime you do a major drivetrain overhaul, you're going to be left with a lot of extra parts. Whether it's an old engine that you're replacing or an entire drivetrain, the stuff takes up a lot of space, like old transmissions, transfer cases, front differential, or even small parts like brackets and wiring harnesses. It kind of clutters things up. A lot of people are tempted to load everything up and go to the dump and just get rid of it, or even stick it on Craigslist and make a couple of quick bucks. The problem with that is, well, there's a lot of small parts that are still attached to your old drivetrain that you will need to reuse. And if you get rid of it too soon, it'll come back and bite you. I always tell people, save everything until the project is 100% done and you're running and driving down the road with no issues. Then you can load up and clean out your shop. If you have a higher mileage truck or maybe a vehicle with a blown engine, you'll want to refresh it with a remanufactured engine of the same type. So you'll probably grab a long block. We ordered a 5.3 LS for our K1500. And as you can see, you only get the basics like the engine block, cylinder heads, oil pan, valve covers, and balancer. But every accessory required to run the engine is not included when you purchase a long block. Obviously, a small block Chevy and an LS are not the same engine. But the point is this, whenever you're installing a long block, there's a lot of parts you're going to need to reuse. Take the accessory drive, for example. You've got the air conditioning pump, the alternator, the water pump, power steering pump, plus the tensioners, idlers, and all the small brackets needed to make everything line up properly. Then there's a lot of other parts, like the starter, exhaust manifold, intake manifold, the fuel injection system, and all the sensors up top. Plus, you've got a flex plate out back, a distributor here, and there's a lot of stuff you need to reuse. Now, we are doing an engine swap, but that doesn't mean we're out of the woods because there's still some stuff we need to transfer over. Like, we already repurposed our motor mounts. There's going to be some sensors we pull out so the factory gauges still work. And then you've got something as simple as this, the vacuum line for the brake booster. We can easily adapt this to work on our 5.3, saving a couple of bucks. When we pulled the powertrain out of Project Red Tide, I also took the time to remove the entire underhood wiring harness, and not a single wire was cut. Now, this is a perfect example of why you want to save the parts until the job is done. Now, the TBI computer obviously will not control an LS engine, and most of the wires in the engine branch of the harness are not going to be reused, but there are some circuits here that we need to keep. Things like power distribution, 
air conditioning, and the wires that run the gauges up to the instrument cluster. Now, if you're in this situation, you have a lot of work ahead of you, but you'll be thankful that you kept the original wires to work with. You just have to cut this thing apart, pull out the circuits that you want to keep, and put it all back together. But you have the parts to work with, and that's what matters. The old small block is out of here, and that new 5.3 and 4L80E are permanently bolted into their new home. Obviously, it doesn't run yet. We've got a few more goodies left to install. And we just got in some new exciting drivetrain parts that will really make Red Tide stand apart from the crowd. I have an announcement to make. After a long search, we found a new co-host for Truck Tech. His name is Austin LaFort, a lifelong hot rodder and gearhead from New Orleans via California. He'll be joining our team here in a few weeks. Looking forward to it. For more information on Red Tide or any of our other builds, be sure to check out PowerNationTV.com.